This is what revolution looks like. I'm tired of losing. I love Star Wars, and considering that you clicked on this video, I assume that you do too. So thank you for the forma, and let's get into Lada. Andor, and what makes it the Star Wars we deserve, and the trilogy we should have gotten in the first place. Ever since the release of Episode 1, there have been discussions about what exactly qualifies as Star Wars, and this was sparked even further by the release of Disney's new trilogy, the show was following it, and the grown-up but still bombastic Rogue One. And 10 years after Disney bought LucasArts, we finally have a Star Wars show that actually understands the essence of what George Lucas created and manages to communicate that properly onto the screen. But that begs the question. What is Star Wars? According to Lucas, it's a contemporary myth created with mythological motifs. Life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. With its story centered around a politician provoking a war to rise to power before he escalates it even further to cement his position as an emperor until the stranglehold on his people grows so tight that a rebellion is formed. Everything I did, I did for the rebellion. This brings us to Tony Gilroy's brilliant Andor. And let's get the obvious out of the way first. It's slow. Very slow. It's almost exclusively character and narrative driven and takes its time developing these elements. But I urge you to keep watching as it undoubtedly has some of the most intriguing personalities and story developments outside of Lucas's original movies. Everywhere. They're watching me now. Soon enough, these days will end. But what makes Andor unique is that the narrative outline allows it a luxury it does not share with most of the shows, knowing that it has to end. Andor is set up as a two-season, 24-episode series set a few years before Rogue One, allowing it to focus on exactly where it has to go and how it has to end, giving it a sense of direction Disney's other shows are severely lacking. And not only does that make it the missing link between episode 3 and 4, but with two seasons and one movie, it's also the trilogy we and the franchise narrative need to probably conclude this decade-spanning space opera. And with it, it brings some of the most fleshed-out characters since the original trilogy. Luna as Cassian Andor, Genevieve O'Reilly as Mon Mothma, and Denise Gauth as Daedra Miro are outstanding. But it's Stellan Skarsgård, Luthan Rail, who catapults himself into the ranks of the most compelling characters in franchise history. As, very much like Anakin Skywalker was supposed to be, the man in pursuit of bringing back balance and peace to the galaxy. But in this case, with all means necessary, whether it's corruption, deception, or even death. Call it what you will. Let's call it war. Pondering the questions of whether the end justifies the means and how far you are allowed to go before you become the evil you are attempting to defeat. All while showing you the rebellion from the everyday people's perspective, the impact on their lives and the escalating extremes they are confronted with. And this is brought to life with calm and steady cinematography, incredible real-life locations, beautiful sets, over 200 named cast members and 6,000 crowd people, accompanied by an excellent tribal and emotional score that still manages to perfectly underline the calm and ponderous moments while giving the soundscape the space it needs to use the incredible Skywalker sound effects arsenal to its full extent. Episode 3 in particular is incredible. Fish. Are you a thief? The biggest question after Andrew is whether Disney has 
any supervision over the Star Wars universe they are creating, because not only are the tone and narrative structure of their shows vastly different from each other, but they also push the overarching story and characters in different directions, giving them the possibility to create dozens of shows that are barely coherent on their own, but even less so as a whole, as The Mandalorian's third season and the catastrophic Obi-Wan Kenobi have shown. While Rogue One and Andor are trying to build and improve on the remnants Lucas's movies left us with, and doing a pretty fantastic job with it. We need to capture the plans if there's any hope of destroying it. We want to help. All right. How many do I need? I'll be there for you. The captain said I had to. But what does that mean for the future of Star Wars? As George Lucas clarified in an interview with 60 Minutes in 2005, there is no episode 7, as the story of these characters is concluded. No, absolutely, positively, you're really ab closing the door without right. any wiggle room whatsoever. Right. There is no episode 7. And as much as I love all things Star Wars, I agree with him. And if Andor's second season is only half as good as its first one, I for one will consider this show and Rogue One as canon and ignore everything else released by Disney, because that way I can finally, with episodes 1 to 6 and Clone Wars, consider the story that is Star Wars has concluded and move on from it. And maybe so should you. Thank you very much for watching, and remember, wherever your journey continues to carry you, the Force will be with you. Always.